Welcome and hello. Today I'll be reviewing a video straight from Trigonometry that pits Stephen Banal II versus Sebastian Gorka. So let's have some quick intros. Here we go! On the left, you have Stephen Banal II, known as Destiny, during his streamer days and still to this day as a political YouTube commentator. He's recently been going around and participating on a lot of conservative-based websites, YouTube channels, etc., arguing from essentially a liberal political stance. On the right, you have Doctor of Political Science Sebastian Gorka. For a short time, he was the deputy assistant under Trump and has had a career in positions in the media from things like uh, being on Newsmax TV to Fox News and even Salem Radio. What I'll be doing today is going through their fact-based arguments and seeing if the research matches their statements. I'll attempt to cut out all the character attacks from both sides, and I'll try and avoid any conjecture points that don't have verifiable facts, such as any section where both individuals are essentially using their information to guess at what may come or what will come. I don't really care about any of that. Just who's being the most truthful, who's the most right from a fact standpoint. If you do care about those things or want all of that in there, go check out the full video. I'll put the link in the description. So let's begin. And one of the things we agreed before is that both of you get a chance to set out a positive case for your candidate, something that we never hear anymore because everyone just criticizes the other person. So uh, given that Biden is the incumbent, Stephen, do you want to start us off? I think this is really important that trigonometry sets the standard, that they get an intro into a positive stance about their person, as it were, Biden versus Trump in this case. That's really important because negative things are really easy to get into like a whataboutism or a red herring or to just say like, well, this one was bad, but this one was worse. And then you get into a lot of opinion generation. When you start focusing on positive, what did they do? What policies did they have? What effect did they create? That's really good and a lot more defensible in terms of, you know, facts and generating research and stuff like that. Something I will say uh, about both of them is that I am cutting out some of their negativity towards the other candidate because I really want to hone in on what are they selling us on for their person and for their side. I will only use their kind of negative commentary when it comes to the arguments back and forth, should those actually be fact-based versus just opinion or a character assassination kind of basis. Yeah. Uh, I Why think is that, he good? I think that Biden is a good president because I think that he's shown that uh, he's willing to uh, defend and strengthen our institutions. I think that the United States is only as strong as the institutions that we have. Um, you can have parchment guarantees from constitutions that say you're afforded X, Y, Z rights, or you know, you're guaranteed in the United States to be able to do some particular things. But at the end of the day, if we don't have a government telling you that the food is safe or this medicine is safe or your car is not going to explode at the end of the day, um, I, I think that none of those things actually matter, the, the parchment guarantees. So I, think I paused here to talk a little bit about what a parchment guarantee is. If you didn't get it from the context, it's something like, a law or a right that is put down on a piece of paper. So much of our Bill of Rights, for instance, are parchment guarantees as the framers would have seen it. They're not really meaning anything unless we have the ability to back them up, to defend them, to ensure that people actually have them. So if it's just a parchment guarantee, they don't really do anything. So for instance, freedom of speech is only so good as the actual actions and laws that protect that freedom versus, say, just putting that down on the piece of paper. That's easy. The actual guarantee or the actual right in force, that's hard. Um, the second thing is I think Biden has done a really good job at being able to actually bring different people in Congress together to pass legislation. I think that bipartisanship is really important right now, considering how divided we are. Uh, Biden was able to pass the um, the IRA and the CHIPS Act, which both have like fostered a ton of new manufacturing that's been happening in the United States, which I think, which I think is really cool because we're finally building stuff again. I know that this is just an intro, but Destiny is trying to make a case here. So you've got the manufacturing process, CHIPS uh, Act, which uh, brings actually like building back to the United States along with some other uh, things as well, because it's technically the CHIPS and Science Act. 
You have the infrastructure bill, which is the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, which brings about like all those bridges and internet and water and everything else that people were talking about. And then the Inflation Reduction Act, which does a lot more beyond that. So these actually do spur a lot of money into the manufacturing world, but it wouldn't necessarily mean much unless people were benefiting from them. Biden was quoted for saying that he had helped, you know, to bring back 800,000 new manufacturing jobs, which would actually be pretty amazing because that is something that presidents have ran on a couple of times in the recent history. Biden got close, 789,000 at that time. I'm pretty sure it's pretty close to the 800,000 more now. Um, and in addition to that, post-recessions don't really see a rebound effect, not typically in manufacturing existence. So Biden actually has gained more post the recession than the actual recession took away. That is actually pretty remarkable over the period of time. Now, a lot of this has to come with spending associated with it, uh, but this is actually benefiting Americans. And in a large part, the CHIPS Act helps us pull away from foreign interests being required uh, to you know, be allies with people we may not want to be, morally speaking. Uh, because they build all the chips and all the memory and all those things for our computers and everything that we actually need as both consumers, military, and the government to run. Thanks. Uh, Seb, what's your case for Trump? He loves America. He doesn't hate America. It's really that simple. And uh, he understands the institutions are either broken or corrupt. In this instance, I really want to give Seb a chance but he's not really laying out something that could be fact-checked, as it were. So he's just saying Trump loves America, and he has a lot of negative things early on to say against his opponent. Uh, I took out the ones from Destiny, so I'm trying to take out the ones from him as well in order to make sure that what we're focused on is the positive things he did. Uh, he is not part of the quote-unquote political elite. I don't really know what he would mean or what he would include as elite versus not elite, but I'm going to give it to him. You know, definitely if you're looking at a lot of the politicians out there, they've been there or their family members have been there a long time and we've had two Bushes right in a row, right? So I will grant this case to him as one of the points he wants to prove. And we'll see if once data starts to show up or a more qualifiable statements happen, if it holds up. There's a reason that working class Americans from across the nation voted for him in 2016. There's it is definitely true that people across the United States, regardless of the state, did actually vote in part or in some for Donald Trump. There's a reason that recently in Harlem, we saw what? We saw a black 10 year old child ch chant out, we love you, Trump which was then picked up by all the adults around that young boy because they see in that man authenticity. He's not a machine career politician. I love you, Trump! I love you, Trump! Love Trump. So as you can see in the video, it's just a slight misdescription of the video, but I'll give it to him. It's good. And that's why he's trouncing Biden in every significant poll in America. This one being polls-based says, yeah, Trump is beating Biden in a lot of different polls. Browning is a little bit of a harsh term, but I'll give it to him. There's some polls where Trump is up five or six points versus other polls where he's only up one or two points, which as a note is a significant reduction from the nine to 12 points that Trump was up just late last year. Uh, and do you, is it really, did you, is it really true that like the Biden and the people around him hate America? I mean, what else would you do for three and a half years if your ostensible goal was actually to destroy America? What would you do differently? Nothing. You'd open the borders. This one's an interesting point because from March 2020 to February 2022, there were 1.7 million expulsions from this country. 1.2 million of those happened under Biden. That doesn't mean an open border policy. Now, I kind of understand what he's saying because there were protections for dreamers and a few other things for executive orders that Biden did sign into law and made it potentially easier for the concern and problem that was happening today. However, to just simply say it's open is not correct. That is more like it's more open than perhaps un than it was under Trump. But also there's an argument to be said that things were actually building up 
during the pandemic. So I'm hoping he has more information on this later in the video. You'd give billions of dollars to uh, the greatest state-sponsored terrorism in the world, Iran, that every Friday chants death to America. This one's a little tougher to unpack. He does say the Biden administration gave $6 billion or billions of dollars to the Iranians. This isn't actually true. We didn't actually give them anything. But I see his point. Billions of dollars were unfrozen for Iran. This is money that they made from selling oil exports and such. It was actually in South Korean bank accounts, frozen from under the Trump administration, which was actually a good thing, right? So that $6 billion was also now transferred to a Qatar bank account where it is required to be overseen and only be used for medicine or humanitarian needs. At the point of the attack, that money had still yet been touched. It was not uh, at all used. So it was still just sitting in that Qatar bank account. So whether the Iranians were funding something or not, it didn't come from those billions of dollars. But still to this point, right, it's one of those things where we don't really want to give billions of dollars to terrorists. In this case, it was for a hostage deal, which is also a good thing where we get hostages freed. That's also a good thing. So we have a lot of good intents with billions of dollars at stake with terrible actors doing horrible things all conflicting together. So it's not as simple as he put it, but it's a fair point. Trump did a good thing freezing the assets, and it's questionable whether or not it was worth it to unfreeze those assets. So at least it's kind of leaning in that side. You'd undermine our relationship with our closest ally in the Middle East, Israel. Stop sending them the weapons they need to save themselves from the bloodthirsty jihadists that killed more Jews than we've ever seen since the end of the show, the end of the Holocaust. You I guess this one I hear a little bit more recently because of the pause that Biden said, hey, if you go into Rafa in a significant way and you were using these gigantic bombs to kill civilians, we're not going to give you munitions to do that and ended up pausing like 2000 pound bombs that have 365 meter gigantic radiuses that's 1200 feet roughly for all of my american friends that is those are really big bombs in a densely populated area so they paused that but what they didn't pause were things like pink rounds mortars armored tactical vehicles so we were still shipping them what they need to fight the evil jihadists, as Seb puts it, but we weren't shipping them the things that were going to explode giant civilian areas. You'd make it harder for Americans to live their lives. When, when on the first day of the Biden administration, you ban the Exxon Keystone Pipeline extension, you say no more fracking, no more energy exploration on federal lands. And what do we have? We go from $1.80 a gallon of petrol so now we have, in California, $6. When you're a, a, a man who lives on how much it costs to put a full tank of gas in your car, if you're a worker, if you're a plumber, if you're a carpenter, you've crushed tens of millions of people. That is only possible if you hate the nation in which you live. All right, so there's a lot to unpack in this short segment about gas prices and hating America. So the first thing we've got to realize is that on this point, he's telling some truths and some incorrect information. I won't say that anyone is lying because I don't know their internal intents. And he seems like a genuinely kind of passionate individual about these things. So one thing he says is, uh, you know, under Trump, the gas prices hit $1.80. It was because of the denial of the XL Keystone pipeline that gas prices started to shoot back up. If that were true, then in 2015, when the XL Keystone Pipeline was actually uh, shut down as well, that deal, then gas prices would have been much higher all the way through Trump's administration. But Trump actually re allowed reapplication for the XL Keystone Pipeline. And gas prices were under $2 under Obama. If you have a moment in time under $2 where the XL Keystone Pipeline wasn't going, and you have under $2 under Trump while the XL Keystone Pipeline is allowed to go forward. Then Biden gets into the administration. He doesn't have the pandemic preventing demand, right? Because people are driving again. 
So, and gas prices start to go back up. There's lots of reasons for that, but it did actually go up to a peak in the $5 range under the Biden administration. So just looking at those dollars, you'd say, well, 180, five something, that's pretty bad. But that's actually a peak and it happened uh, sometime in 2022 and gas prices have started to fall again. Now they're on average about $3.60. Joe Biden, although he said the XL Keystone pipeline was a no, has said yes to more oil drilling. And fracking is still going on. We have fracking happening right around my neighborhood here in Pennsylvania. That's not been stopped. So his argument about these things being the only factors that lead to gas prices and a person who's against those things would then have higher gas prices and thus hate America doesn't really pan out very well. There's some things in there, yes, and definitely gas prices need to come down, especially for the working class folks in order to be able to get groceries, pay for bills, um, be able to work and commute. Like all of those things are very much true. But if his argument is that someone artificially is creating those prices to be really high because they hate America, then as they come back down, he's got to admit then that person doesn't hate America as much, right? That they start to like America. At the very least at this point in time, you would have to argue that Joe Biden actually does love America for the same reasons that he's arguing Trump does, even though they're not getting to the same dollar amount. Stephen, there's quite a lot there. I'm going to come back to some of the points you made in, in your opening and let Seb probe them as well. But there was a lot there. Do you want to come back on that? So at this point in time, we've gotten done with just the intros. And this is the amount of research to kind of combat these folks with. You can see all of the resource links that I reviewed inside of the description, and this will be ongoing throughout the various parts, and I'll try and keep the titles going as well. What I would want to do is make a little bit of an assessment right now. So between the two, I would say the pro for uh, Sebastian Gorka the, is that I didn't have to cut as much about his anti-Biden stuff as I would as I did for Destiny, and I mean by individual points. So when he was talking about the pros for Trump, he had more positive things to say for Trump and fewer negative things to say about Biden. To be fair, though, on Destiny's side, his arguments were actually much more rich in terms of data orientation and less character orientation. And so in the same kind of way, while Destiny was more data-oriented, uh, Sebastian was actually more character-oriented. And a lot of that got cut because his descriptions of Trump were basically opinions. They didn't actually come from facts. So I did cut to those points where they were just factual-based and the things that could be backed up from either news media or other pieces that lended some credibility to what he was saying. Both of them have information there. And right now, there's no conclusions to be made just yet. Uh, but I would say that, you know, these characters, these individuals, uh, I almost called them characters because of online media characters, right? Talk show host people. Um, these folks, um, they definitely do approach this problem very differently. Destiny's argument comes from trying to be compelling through knowledge. And this is very typical of his other videos. What I know from my work is that knowledge does not convince people. Knowing something doesn't change whether or not you fundamentally believe something unless you're specifically just a 100% data-oriented individual and you're asking a genuine question. That's why analysts oftentimes ask a question and then go to the data to find the answer. On the reverse side, uh, Dr. Sebastian Gorka's arguments were actually really compelling from a character standpoint, but start to fall apart as you start to actually look at them. He used a lot more descriptions, storytelling. Uh, he even used a personal anecdote. None of these things actually talk about in the grand scheme of things why one person might be better than the other. But one of them is more compelling on an individual basis. So I hope that you enjoyed this review, that you enjoyed this fact checking and look forward to the remaining parts. This is a very long video and I do want to chunk it up into pieces. So wait to see the next part soon. This video is brought to you by Caffeine Zombies.
Coffee's so good, it'll wake the dead.